big, aggressive, ugly. Yet, we cannot imagine the festive season without this iconic bird that shaped the ways of our family celebrations. But how and when did turkey become a bird that we associate with celebration? And where do turkeys come from? Hint, not from Turkey. I'm Gabby Winkler and you are watching Etymology, a series about the mind-blowing history of the food that we eat every day. And today we are going to talk about the quintessential centerpiece of our festive family celebrations, the turkey. There are many theories regarding the history of turkey as food, and there are also many theories regarding the definition of a turkey as a bird. At the beginning, people didn't really know where they came from. Some early food historians believed turkeys were originally from India and were already eaten by the ancient Greeks. Most likely these birds were guinea fowls, relatives of turkeys. And just to add to the confusion, the words turkey and guinea fowl were often used interchangeably. Real turkeys are native to the Americas. Fossil records show that they've been around about 5 million years. They share a common ancestor with grouse, pheasants and other fowls. The wild turkey, which is the ancestor of the domestic turkey, was domesticated approximately 2000 years ago in Mexico. There are many confusing things about turkeys. First of all, let's look at its English name. Why is turkey called turkey if it's not from Turkey? So many turkeys. It is disputed how exactly the word turkey made its way into the English language. According to one of the theories, long before the colonization of the Americas, Turkish traders introduced some guinea fowls from Guinea, West Africa, to the European markets, leading the English to refer to the bird as turkey cock, cock being French for rooster, which eventually shortened to turkey. Other theories claim that the North American bird was brought to Europe by Turkish traders from Constantinople and the English named the bird after the merchants who sold them. It could also be the case that there were already guinea fowls in Europe that were called turkeys and when the Spanish slash Portuguese brought the North American bird to the European markets everybody got confused. And what makes the whole thing even more confusing is that in Turkey, which has no native turkeys, People don't call turkey turkey, they call it a Hindi, because they thought the bird was Indian. And they weren't alone. The French called the bird dand, originally puli dand, meaning chicken from India. And want to know how they say turkey in Hindi? And in Portuguese, by the way, Peru. <laughs> At least they weren't too far from the truth. And looking at Turkey's scientific name would just add to our confusion. Its Latin name, Malagris Galapavo, is technically a made-up word. The first part of the name comes from a Greek myth about Malagir. This is a little bit complicated story, but in a nutshell, Malagir killed some family members in a dispute. His mother, as a revenge, killed him, and when she realized what she did, she committed suicide, leaving her daughters to cope with a complete family catastrophe. Poor daughters were so devastated that Artemis turned them into guinea fowls to ease their pain. The second name is a mix of two different words. Gallo is derived from the Latin word for rooster, gallus, while pavo is the Latin word for peacock. So the official name for a turkey is... Drumroll! Guinea fowl rooster peacock. All in one. Yes. All right, hopefully we clarify the confusion about the name of the turkey. Or not. Anyways, so the question is, when did we start eating turkeys? People domesticated turkeys in the Americas around 2000 years ago. It is likely that at the beginning they were kept for their important symbolic and cultural role. One of the main Aztec gods, Tezcatlipoca, aka Smoking Mirror, 
has a Turkey manifestation. I'm not going to try to pronounce that one. In other name, the jeweled or precious turkey was the god of disease and plague. It was believed that he could cause illness and could also cure people from diseases and contamination. And it was also a very, very popular ingredient. Bernanido de Sahagún, a Spanish Franciscan friar and explorer, described the different dishes made by the indigenous peoples in the Americas. Among iguanas, armadillos and frogs, Turkey had a prominent place on the menu. Sahagun tells us that Aztec rulers were served turkey moles with chili, as well as turkey in yellow chili, turkey in green chili and turkey tamales. So they definitely liked their turkey. Turkeys are believed to have been brought to Europe by the Portuguese and they instantly became a hit. Although they were confused with guinea fowls for some centuries, the huge bird quickly became an exotic showpiece on a wealthy person's dinner table. King Henry VIII is the first known English king to have eaten turkey. One of the reasons for turkey's appeal was that it was not only huge enough to make an extravagant display on the table, but also it was tastier and less chewy than other exotic royal favorites like the peacock. So what is the thing between turkey and Thanksgiving? Love to eat turkey. <laughs> Love to eat turkey. <laughs> Love to eat turkey, cause it's good. Love to eat the turkey like a good boy should. Cause it's turkey to eat, so good. Historians do not believe that turkey was eaten during the first Thanksgiving in 1621. Most likely the pilgrims ate venison, geese and duck, and probably they had some wild turkey as well. The myth of the Thanksgiving turkey comes from Sarah Josepha Hale, a prominent 19th century magazine editor anti-slavery novelist and supporter of female education. In parentheses, she was also the author of the nursery rhyme Mary Had a Little Lamb. Later, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed Thanksgiving a real holiday in 1863. According to legend, Lincoln had started the turkey eating tradition with an unofficial Thanksgiving dinner that featured roast turkey, reportedly his favorite meal. The Lincoln family is also credited with starting the tradition of issuing a presidential pardon for the most fortunate turkey. So the story goes, Abraham Lincoln spared the Christmas turkey after his son begged him to not kill the bird, which became a pet. President JFK was the first president to pardon a Thanksgiving turkey in 1963. Despite the message hanging around the turkey's neck, good eating Mr. President, Kennedy decided to spare its life. The true answer to why turkey became a popular festive meal is very pragmatic. Unlike a chicken, a huge turkey could feed a lot of people. It makes sense to kill one bird for one dinner instead of sacrificing a dozen of chickens, right? And how about Turkey for Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> Merry Christmas to you! <laughs> Before the arrival of Turkey to Europe, boar was a particularly popular option for the festive season. Stuffed boar's heads were served as a Christmas centerpiece in England from the medieval period right up until Tudor times. The boar's head in hand bear I, bedecked with bays and rosemary, and I pray you, my masters, be merry. Quod est is in convivio. Goose was also another popular option. By the 18th century, turkey became almost as popular as goose, and would be eaten at Christmas quite frequently. However, it wasn't until the Victorian era when turkey finally began to become the most eaten meat at Christmas. One of the reasons is Charles Dickens. Turkeys were also used as part of the infamous Christmas pie. This extravagant dish involved stuffing a pigeon inside a chicken, which was then stuffed inside a goose, which was then stuffed inside a turkey, then inside a pastry case called a coffin, 
serve with other game birds on the side. And that's it. What a mouthful. Mm. But actually the true king of culinary absurdity of stuffing dead animals inside each other comes from an 1807 cookbook, the Almanac des Gourmands, written by Grimaud de la Reynière, who is a guy who faked his own death to see who would attend his funeral. Not a weirdo at all. Well, anyway, his creation, the Roti Sans Pareil, the roast without eco, was one of the most extravagant examples of the art of ingastration. Ingastration is a cooking technique in which the remains of one animal are stuffed into another dead animal. Fun! Vegan paradise! Joking. So if you wanted to make this recipe, you would need 17 different types of birds. First, a huge bustard, stuffed with a turkey, stuffed with a goose, stuffed with a pheasant, stuffed with a chicken, stuffed with a duck, stuffed with a guinea fowl, stuffed with a teal, stuffed with a woodcock, stuffed with a partridge, stuffed with a plover, stuffed with a lapwing, stuffed with a quail, stuffed with a thrush, stuffed with a lark, stuffed with an orphan bunting, stuffed with a garden warbler, stuffed with an olive, stuffed with an anchovy, stuffed with a single caper, stewed in a hermetically sealed pot and slowly cooked over a fire for at least 24 hours. What is a turkey roast compared to this? Well, my dear, dear friends, what a motley looking crew we have in front of us here. As you can see, 15 birds all labelled up. Even though consuming turkey is a century-long tradition in many households across the globe, we cannot gloss over the fact that most turkeys we get in the shops are factory farmed. The life of a factory farmed turkey is completely different from those of the wild turkeys. In the wild, these birds live in complex social groups, complete with unique orders, rituals and dances. They stick together in flocks as they spend their days foraging, sleeping on the trees during the night. The factory farmed turkey's life is controlled to maximize the final weight of the turkey for profit. Factory farm turkey chicks are hatched via artificial insemination. Within four days after hatching, their toes and claws are cut off and they are de-beaked. The sharp part of the beak is cut off so they cannot hurt each other in close spaces. They spend their lives in enclosed barns with thousands of other birds, receiving a specially formulated feed mixture until they reach their ideal weight, at which time they are sent to slaughter. So what can you do if you don't want to give up your yearly festive roast, but you are also concerned about turkey well-being? First of all, try to look for free-range birds from local farms, which are passionate about animal welfare, and they raise their birds in a traditional way. Also, don't just eat the breast. Use the whole animal for cooking, for example, you can make an amazing soup the next day from the leftover bones and carcass. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode about turkeys and you learned something new. Do you like turkey roasts? And do you make them for the festive season? I'm also curious, how do you say turkey in your language? So let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.